I um, want to talk a little bit about Gamma, inshallah. Gamma was founded by Abbas Mohammed in San Francisco Bay Area in September of 2016. It has since spread across North America with the chapters in New York City, Detroit, and with artists and the community members throughout the world. Gamma's mission is to build a platform of professional support and creative liberation for Muslim artists to facilitate the growth of authentic creative communities based on inclusive, inclusivity and trust and to scale these communities throughout the world by facilitating networks of artistic collaboration. I am a member of Gamma, alhamdulillah. Today is actually get at the Gamma anniversary, right? Is that correct, Daniel? That's correct, mashallah. Uh, so happy, happy. Allah, congratulations. Congratulations, four years now. All right. Okay, mashallah. let me turn this over to Maya Eatman. Assalamu alaikum, Maya, welcome. Alaikum salam, rahmatullah. Hey, how are you? Um, thank you for doing this with us first, first off. Oh, thank you for asking and suggesting that I do it with you first. <laughs> oh, I knew that you could handle this. I knew that you could handle this. Let me go get right into your work. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to take a look at Maya's setup. Okay, so let's get started. All right, Maya. So take us through your work right now. Okay, well. Your work tells a very intriguing story. Yeah, thank you. Um, so a lot of my work is, um, I started off as a painter initially. Um, but as time went by, you know, I started discovering other mediums. Um, I always did uh, artwork. But in terms of like formal education in college, it started a little later. Like, um, I think I was in my 20s when I went to uh, attended SUNY Purchase. And then I realized like I could take everything that I really loved and can kind of combine it together um, to express, you know, certain ideas about culture. Um, I get a lot of my ideas from reading. I get a lot of my ideas from my family. And a lot of it is just kind of a process of making. Um, but in my process, like the heroes are always unapologetically Black, unapologetically uh, human and strong, and always kind of um, reflect back to the human condition. And also in my religious practice, which is Islam, um, you know, there's that spiritual uh, middle path that I'm always like seeking and trying to explore, kind of dealing with my art. Um, so my process is a lot of times I don't use a lot of color. So uh, the first one here is a fairly recent one. And uh, I'd say it's like a collage. And the thing about that is I was uh, kind of listening to, a, well, I was uh, exploring this kind of genre called um, Afrofuturism, okay? And then so thinking about where Afrofuturism kind of came from, and uh, I do listen to a lot of music. So one of the inspirations for this besides Afrofuturism is um, Parliament Funkadelic. So there was a group in the 60s and 70s, and you know they kind of were like fantastical in their, um, costume and then their concepts and so that kind of led me to afrofuturism and this is something that i thought of and i thought about like mythology right telling our own stories so this is this is a, a combination of all those things like afrofuturism mythology uh parliament funkadelic and this is what i came came up with so what i'm hoping out of this piece is that um, it continues on and grows, right? And so where I find the balance is, you know, like there's a queen and there's a king, right? In most mythological stories, there's a king and there's a queen, or there's like two central characters. And you know, how do, how do they affect the world and how are they affected by the world? So this is where this is first, this is the first of many, I'm hoping, and what about this piece? Okay, so this one, um, so in my practice as my formal practice, we had to do in um, college, we did figure drawing. 
And it was the first time I did figure drawing. And I think I drew the model like an inch tall, right? And it was such a shock to me because I never, you know, looked at the human body like that. So in being a practicing Muslim, I choose not to, you know, just depict the entire body. So um, how I had to figure out a way that I can, you know, depict the form. And so underneath the skin, a lot of times you can see the striations of muscle and you can see different kinds of forms. So I just kind of picked that up and like took the skin away and then um, brought that striation up to the surface. And so with that, I felt like a certain freedom that I could use to depict uh, the human body. It's an abstract form, but it does, if you look at it, sometimes it's more, it can look like more than one thing, but it does represent the human body for me. And that's how I find like that balance. And, you know, it's not conflicting with my uh, religious beliefs. And, you know, there's a certain amount of liberation in that, right? Because um, like you think about Picasso and, you know, how he, abstra how he did uh, abstract work, of course, these are like kind of based on African motifs, but, you know, bring it in into the, you know, European um, world, they looked at it like, wow, you know, of course, you know, it was always there. So it's the same kind of idea for me. So this is like, this is supposed to depict a mother with a child on her back. Mm. And, right. So, and her arms are kind of adjusting her little papoose in the back. Okay. So that's when I started, that's the idea that I went with. What was the, what did you use to draw this? Okay. I drew, I just used a, um, a paint pen. So it's a fine tip paint pen of silver paint. And um, the reason why I like it is because uh, once the lines meet each other, it creates like depth, it creates like different weight lines. So it does give it like, um, so the tradition, when you draw traditionally, you know, there are certain things that you rely on to bring your, you know, bring your drawing to life. And since I wasn't doing that, you know, I just kind of let the paint pen uh, be that thing that actually, um, you know, brought those formal elements to life. So it gives it some depth, it gives it some, you know, some weight, some plasticity in the Latin sense, right? And it gives it some grounding. This one. So this one is, okay. <laughs> so this one is, this is actually two that I just drew separately. And this is just a, um, a fine tip um, paint marker. And this one is, is supposed to be a cross section of hair, right? So as a black woman, um, you know, I don't, I don't really let, well, I don't know if this is a tradition with other black women, but we don't really tend to let other people touch our hair that we don't know. Okay. It's just not good juju. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, when, when we do, when we um, like are combing out our hair and there's some residual hair and the brush or comb, we usually burn it. So, well, that's from my tradition. I don't know about anybody else, but, you know, I think about all the wisdom and all that hair, right? And what would that wisdom look like? And so I was like, well, cross section of hair, you know, of my hair, maybe this is what it would look like. You know, this is what it is for who I am right now. Okay. And what was the medium that you used to draw this? Um, it's, a, it's like a fine tip uh, pen. So it's a fine tip pen on just, uh, actually the paper is watercolor paper because I like the way, you know, the weight of it and how it feels. This one. Okay. And it's the same kind of marker. So with this, um, I was thinking about a woman going to the marketplace and like, what would she be, what would she be carrying? What would she be taking? And um, I started like with the line and then I just expanded the line. And then I thought about like women going to the marketplace. Um, and when you go to the marketplace, uh, well, I've been to Nigeria before and in the marketplace, you know, they have people playing drums and people are giving them money. People are doing magic tricks, but usually you see men doing these things. You usually see women, you know, they're selling like food, they're selling cloth and whatnot. So I was thinking about, you know, a woman bringing like her, 
you know, bringing something else to the market instead of like that traditional cloth or food. And so her taking this, you know, uh, it's, it's a drum and it's also a spear and a shield, taking that to the market and like, what would, you know, what is she going to do with it? She's going to play her drums. She may be doing some kind of, um, you know, exercise or, you know, some kind of demonstration with her shield and her, um, her, her staff. So that was like the thinking behind this. And then um, that's, so she's, it's supposed to be a woman walking forward and she's carrying the drum and then she's carrying her shield and her spear and she's on her way to the marketplace. And this is also, uh, it's a, a fine tip marker on just um, paper. Okay. And what about this one here? I think that was the last one, right? It was. So my question to you is you are more of an oral historian, Maya. Why do you think that that is when you talk about your work? Well, because, you know, history informs like who, who I am as a person, right? Um, like my family's is, you know, my family is my history, you know, and I think one of the things that my father, um, to a large extent, and then my mother, to a lesser extent, in a different way, they always emphasize that we should know where we come from, right? Because if you know where you come from, then you know where you're going. And that was really always something, and the thing about my, you know, my dad, he always was like, well, he knew my mother's history, her family history. So, to me, uh, that informs, you know, how I look at the world in, in so many ways. You know, on one side of my family, they're part of the first great migration to the north. They were the first black family to buy a single family house in a mostly white neighborhood. There was a black family there, but they had a two family house. But uh, my grandfather wasn't playing that. He didn't want to live with nobody. <laughs> so he bought a single family home. And, you know, as a, a, a largely un, um, unread person or a person who was largely, you know, he was functionally illiterate, I, I believe. And to take that chance to buy a house with just, you know, wasn't going to rely on anything except for him working uh, to sustain this house was like a really big thing. So, you know, it's a lot of strivers. And then my mother's family was part of the second wave of migration of black people to the north and you know their story is a little different you know they're very close-knit and they were very well off in the south but once they uh came to the north which I'm originally from buffalo um you know because they rely so heavily on their families you know there's a lot that um suffered in terms of like having that really big family support that they were used to so I grew up with like a lot of family for a long time. I didn't play with other kids and um, it was just me and my cousins. And then, you know, so we were very close to people in our family. So like I had an aunt, she did art. Um, I had my grandmother, both my grandmothers were very, especially my grandma, my dad's mom, uh, grandma Everlyn, very elegant woman, just, uh, just beautiful. I've never seen, I have, I had never seen her without like lipstick and nail polish. And she was just so sophisticated. And then my other grandmother, she was very like, she took no mess, no nonsense. And she was really, you know, if she wanted something done, she would call the mayor. So, you know, that kind of informs a lot of, you know, what, how I move forward in my life, especially, you know, with my art, because it was something that was always encouraged. You know, a lot of families were like, oh, you should do something very practical. No, they were fine. They were like, okay. Questions, and I was going to ask you, like, did you feel like you had family support? Like, with everything that's going on, even as a, a young a young woman, did you feel like you had your family support with your art practice? Well, I think mostly with my dad. When I told him I was going to go to art school, he was really supportive. My mom was like, oh, what are you going to do for benefits? <laughs> She's like, you finally got a job with benefits. You know, what are you going to do? And I was explaining to her what I was going to do. And, um, yeah, there's a practical, you know, she, she thought it was not practical. So, um, but, you know, my dad had lived in New York, like, you know, many years ago. And I think, you know, he understood that if you wanted to study art, maybe this is the place to go and it's the practical place to go. 
So I did. And, you know, I don't regret coming to New York. I had like a, I've, I'm having a wonderful experience, but initially a really wonderful experience. I got to meet some really great people who I actually just read about in books. I got to work on some films and, you know, I met a lot of people who were very uh, influential in um, helping me to kind of stay in the arts. There's uh, one artist, well, two, one artist, Camille Billups, who recently passed away. You know, I would see her at um, Dean and DeLuca when I was getting lunch for this uh, filmmaker that I worked for. And she would always talk to me and she's like, you know, you keep doing your work. Don't, don't stop doing your work. You know, you keep doing your work. And I always remember that. And, and then this uh, Dorothy White, she lived in Harlem and she had like a salon and I had, and I had did this huge piece and I just did it. It wasn't for an assignment for school or anything. She's like, oh, I want that because, you know, I'm going to be an early collector of your work. And she really, really believed on in me. Her, she actually was married to Charles White. Um, uh, you know, he used to draw. He, he um, influenced uh, Carrie James Marshall, who's one of my like, favorite artists. And, you know, she was like, you know, you just have to stick with it. And, you know, she's like, your style and your rhythm will come but with it. But, you know, life happens sometimes. So Absolutely. for a long time, I kind of stopped. Absolutely. And then even like in having your family and all of these different things that you go through, you're able to still maintain this, this way of thinking, you know? Oh, um, yeah. There's a question. Someone said, you are a superwoman. Okay. What? No, <laughs> just, just a woman. <laughs> I think we all have special guides that keep us on an artistic path, especially since it goes against the grain of social conditioning. Agreed, 100%. Agreed. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a question about your artwork, too. Why is your work largely untitled? Why is it largely, pardon me? Untitled. Um, because I feel like it, it means so much. And then, you know, I can be a little wordy sometimes. <laughs> so, you know, I just kind of feel like, you know, I could write lady going to market. Um, but I, I'm, I'm comfortable with just saying, you know, untitled one, untitled two. You know, I, I, I don't mind other people projecting what they think it should be called onto it. You know, I rarely name any of my work. Even this, this one back here, no name. You know, just, and it's, it's one I feel like I'll be working on for a long time. <laughs> I like, but you know, I don't have a title on some of them because we allow the viewer to kind of feel what they feel, if you know what I mean, about the work yeah. and able to move in without knowing exactly what it is that's happening and they're able to decide for themselves almost. But then titles sometimes do guide them at the same time. So I guess I'm, I'm on the fence about it, but I do understand why you don't want to have a title. Right, so, right. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm neither here nor there about it in, in some instances. You know, I listen to a lot of jazz and right. sometimes they just, you know, it'll be called, you know, I don't know, song one, and I'm like, oh my God. But then you have stuff like Love Supreme, and I'm like, yeah, right. it sounds like a Love Supreme when you right. listen to right. John Coltrane. It hits you where it's supposed to hit you. And it oh, yeah. explains everything. Right, definitely. How do you feel your pieces connect to the theme of liberation? Well, you know, I feel like um, one of the things that when I was little, you know, we couldn't watch certain stuff on TV. I remember my dad was like, oh, we're not watching Hee Haw on this stuff. <laughs> he didn't like we were watching Hee Haw. But it's kind of like, I'm able, I'm liberated when I do my art because I can tell my own story, right? So long, you know, as a woman, as a Black woman, as a Muslim. I remember when I was in sixth grade, we were studying world religion. And they said that, um, Muslims got their name from muslin sheets. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I was just like, sitting in the class looking at people like, did y'all hear this? But they didn't know that what they were saying was not true. And I was like, and this is what happens when someone else tells your story. They are able to manipulate the narrative about your origins, you know, whether it be your race, your religion, your gender. And I feel like liberation is I myself am able to tell my own story and I'm able to convey the greatness 
of, you know, my spiritual belief, you know, my history, you know, my gender, you know, I'm able to do that. Whereas if someone uh, during slavery was stopped reading, they will be killed. So my, if somebody during, you know, um, the Black Wall Street was making too much money, you know, they're about to lose their whole business and get burned out. So my thing is it's like, I am able to use this nonverbal communication and I'm able to tell my story and I'm able to say it like I believe it should be said. And that's very liberating. It makes you feel like, you know what? I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to sit down here and let these people say like, you know, we're Muslim is from Muslim sheets. You know, one of the first installations I did in college, that I actually remember that. And I actually um, hung up sheets between trees on campus and I wrote each, each word about what it was for And you know, they're like, what are you, why are you saying this? I was like, well, because when I was afraid, they were like, you know, Muslim comes from Muslim sheets that they, and the Muslim sheets that they wear. I was like, what? <laughs> it was really crazy. And then so, like the ignorance that they're comfortable with is rampant. But you know, like you said, if someone else is telling your story, then they're able to say whatever they want and what they bring their own prejudices or not into it. And you're not able to say anything because you're not telling the story. So I agree. Exactly. I agree. Exactly. Even now, I know that you're a very political person with all of this political upheaval that's going on now. Like, how do you feel your art hits? Because it hits different now. It, hit, it hits different. How do you think that, you know, we are to... Um, as artists, even as women, as artists, as Muslim, to be joined into this conversation? Well, on a certain level, you know, I feel we have a responsibility as artists because really, if you look at art throughout history, right? Art tells history, right? So you see um, Washington crossing the Delaware. I don't know if he was as charismatic as he was painted, but you know, you see Napoleon. Well, how do you know that these, how these people looked or how do you know you know, the battles that they fought, you know, and then you think about Diego Rivera, you think about how he captured, like, you know, the workers' movement in Mexico and how that inspired, like, the unions of the United States. And, you know, when we were, like, really, you had a chance to really make some money and really live the, the real American dream before this nightmare happened, right? So as artists, I believe we have, and then also you look at the art of, um, during the time of uh, the Black Power Movement. It was very, very, very powerful in terms of like rallying cries and in terms of like um, depicting police violence and justice, uh, especially with the Black Panther um, Party, especially out in um, California. And there are magazines and there are like, uh, you know, articles about, you know, this particular time in, you know, our American history. So I believe that through art that we can tell the story. And I was in DC, um, like about two to three, three weeks ago for the March in Washington. And there is so much art and there is so much, you know, just sophistication and beauty and people telling their story with this medium. And you know, capturing it on camera and on film and just seeing people doing it like right then and there is just so inspiring. And as artists, that's one of our jobs. We tell a story, we tell the history of the time that we're living in right now. And so this is history. And then, you know, 20 years from now, people are gonna be like, oh yeah, you know, this happened and this this art was and this work was influenced by that. So we definitely have a um, we have a duty as artists to show and you know not not just what's happening here but you know places like you know Darfur right um just think about the atrocities that happen there you know how do we know that there are atrocities you know I consider all kinds of uh, photography I consider it art but I also consider it you know is, is documenting you know these things that happen and we it's proof right yep I also feel like you know with Black Lives Matter movement, which has been going on for us forever, right? Yeah, our lives have always mattered. Hello. <laughs> but it's already, you know, yay, you know, it's already happening. And also with the COVID, how has that affected your art practice? 
like for me and, and everyone's always asking you know me I just I felt like a togetherness needed to happen and that's how this whole thing even came about and I wanted to go bigger with my pieces and, and involve more people interacting with each other as opposed to working on singular smaller pieces how did that work for you well I mean <clears throat> usually I kind of call myself a shut-in <laughs> <laughs> but um, just not being, but the thing that I do miss is interacting like with my friends and my peers and my colleagues, especially talking about art, looking at art, that's a really big thing. Um, and looking at it with other people, you know, I enjoy looking at art with others and, you know, going out and looking at art, you right. know, especially, you know, art, artists that I really, you know, love and I'm inspired by. So that was really, you know, difficult because now I'm working from home, my kids are here, my husband is here. Um, Don't you just love it? Here. Yes. What? <laughs> um, you know, I, love, is a, love is a strong word. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. 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 So yes. I'm going to open up the floor for interaction with Maya. Ask her questions. Um, get into it, everybody. You can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Uh, where do you think your work, how do you see it evolving from where it is? Well, that's a really great question. Wow, thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> OK, so where do I, I would love my work to be, one, my main job. You know, that is something, you know, whoa, that would be one of the biggest blessings ever. And to make money from that main job, because, you know, I believe art is, you know, that's what I say. What do you do for a living? I'm an artist. Okay. And then I do blah, 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 blah. I would also like to, I would also like to be able to have a space where I can like go bigger and uh, also expand my ideas. Because a lot of times, you know, I always look at things as not a single one. I kind of look at it as this should be a few, right? Like this one inspired by, like already when I, when I finished it, I was thinking about the next one and what is the evolution of that? And so, and then also I have a lot of studies that I do because, you know, I'm drawing all the time. So I'm deciding, I'm trying to decide, should I do this in painting? Should I do it in drawing? Should I actually try to do it in light or film? And so being able to expand on those ideas, uh, that's what I, I really would love my work to go. Um, I think I'll keep drawing, but I would like to go bigger. And I think, um, and also using more color, because I don't really use a lot of color in my work. Um, it's just something i mean i do consider black white and gray colors maybe other artists don't but i actually do consider them colors so to actually not run away from color and not to like uh say oh you know i don't like using color as like a cop out you know because maybe i don't understand it maybe i just don't know how to put it together um you know but i would love to be able to express more of my ideas using color and feeling comfortable with that okay that was a that was a very um, well rounded answer. Thank you for that question, Waitha. I have a question too. Um, in terms of your medium, Maya, I know that you talked about working with pencil and and marker. Do you feel that you're going to expand on that as you get larger, or when you have your own space to create in, or like what is, what mediums do you find that are to your hands, if you know what I mean? Well, you know that's a really interesting question because. Um, when I started off for painting, I think it was more of an ego thing for me because I had such a hard time mastering oil paint. So I was like, you know, I'm just going to do this. And then one of my professors was like, really just switch the sculpture. And I was like, no, no, because, you know, this is like a classical thing. And I'm like so down with like Van Gogh and Kandesky and I want to like get this thing. But, you know, I kind of, I, I actually feel like I probably should have listened to that instructor because I love putting things together and then seeing where it can go, right? And I see like the possibilities of paper and paint and um, marker together to express an idea. Like this piece behind me is 
reinforcers, uh, a, a, a silver pen, and some African fabric. Because all of those, I feel like in some way express, you know, who I am as a person, like the reinforcers, I'm kind of a square. No, I am a square. African fabric, that's like where my, my some of my ancestry is from. And then the, the silver pen, like that would represent, I think the color of my soul is not, I would say the color of my soul is like silver. And it, and it just always resonated with me, right? So I love the, the thought of putting things together to express an idea and then, uh, and then, you know, seeing it to fruition. So many different kinds of mediums. And as I, yeah, if I, inshallah, I will be getting a space and I will definitely go much, much bigger. Okay. Any other questions for Maya? Assalamu alaikum, Sister Maya. Uh, thank you for Alhamdulillah. Thank you for joining us. Alhamdulillah. Oh, welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, it's it's a real pleasure to have you. And um, yeah, I just I think I have more of a comment than a question, but um, and but also following up on the what was just said about the color. Um, but I, you know, <clears throat> sorry. I think you have like really strong line work. You know, it's very kind of specific how you draw every every line. You know, but then I, I really like the inspired by piece, like the color, like you're using color very strongly as well. So I just want to say, like, would love to see um, you develop that. And especially how you talked about kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of working from from a musical influence, you know, like uh, George Clinton and, you know, all that good stuff. You mentioned jazz as well. But I would just, you know, I just think it'd be really exciting to see you expand on on all those themes, you know, to see where it leads you. You know what I mean? So, um but yeah, the color, the layering, the line work. Um, yeah, so just, it's really strong. So look forward to seeing where you go with it. Oh, Alhamdulillah, thank you. Um, so do I. I mean, um, in this work, I also use some collage, which is like a kind of, not a definite first time thing, but something that I'm also exploring in terms of like, um, what you said, layering, right? Yeah. Um, like, like, I don't have to draw the whole thing out. And then that in itself can be, you know, um, perfected and you know as a as a component to the piece and you know producing like the intention so it's just more and more like a experiment but you know in the smaller studies for this piece um I would have like one like a whole series of like cut out uh Yoruba heads of like these Yoruba deities and then just trying to manipulate them with different materials. And then once I felt comfortable, just kind of putting them all together. So, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, you have to push yourself out of your comfort zone. So this one was like a real, real push out of my comfort zone. So, but it was it, a lot of studies led up to it where I was actually doing these um, like Rorschach kind of paintings. So I would just put the paint on the paper, close it and open it. And then that's how the color kind of developed and I already had the line work. So, you know, a lot of studies uh, led up to this particular piece. So I feel like this piece can lead up to even larger piece and more comprehensive piece with some of the same elements in it. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to see that. And the piece behind you, it, it, it's also, I don't know, it's a, it's not in the slideshow, but it's, it's in the, uh, it's in, it's in the presentation in in a way. So uh, is that an older piece or is it? Um, oh, this one, this is the oldest piece. This is one of the oldest pieces that I have. Actually, this piece, um, I started working on it right before I had my son, who is now 17. And I just keep adding to it. And what it is is supposed to be like a representation of like my growth as a spiritual being. Like initially, it just started with the silver. Then I was like, you know, I don't know, I was just going through this like really serious nerd, like nerdy period. And I was just like, you know, I have to embrace my inner nerd. And I was like, what is more nerdy than reinforcers? Like, I love reinforcers. Like that was, and nobody uses them anymore. So I went to this dollar store and I just bought a ton of them. And I was like, okay, so let me just, you know, put that on there. And then I was thinking about, you know, myself as a person of um, African ancestry. So that's part of who I am also. So now I think I'm just kind of just growing it 
and just evolving it and moving it forward. So I actually showed it in um, a show that I had at Joe Loft, which was a group show. So I feel like it's always going to be evolving. You know, like, I feel like I'm always going to be evolving, you know, as a human being, as a Muslim, and as a person, you know, who identifies as a woman, of you know, a Black woman. So you should, I, I feel like I should always be evolving, and then I want my work to always evolve with that, you know, and I want that to reflect, they should reflect each other to me. Agreed, agreed. I remember that group show. That's how I know that you're an oral historian, because you, your pieces are very succinct. Um, this piece um, inspired by me as well because as a you know I'm a collagist too so it's like oh my god so mm -hmm. much fun, but it's very intentional at the same time and freeing I really I really enjoyed it and I know how you are about color so it was like yeah oh, 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 I see you I see you Maya I exactly you. exactly any more comments Yes, so I'll make a comment since Oh um, hi. Hi, how are you? Nice Good. to see you. How are you doing? Thank you. Nice to see you too. I, I love your I love your inner child that comes out. And um but anyways, I wanted to say that your line work kind of reminds me. Right at the end. Or are you not? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? You just kind of dropped out. Your line work within your sort of your forms it reminds me of being an air type. Is, are you like sort of a musical air type? I mean, I don't know too much about you, but it seems like you have a sort of... Wait, will you, say, will you say musical air type? What do you mean? Like air, like you know what, what oh. air type means? Like in, as an archetype, as, a, as an element, as a kind of... Um, dominant element of yours is is that one of your elements uh well that's it's funny that you say that i actually <laughs> uh yeah i actually used to play the french horn and the clarinet and okay. um most music i can like i never like i might forget somebody's name but i rarely ever forget any music and i mean like all the way from like patsy klein to led zeppelin <laughs> um right. punk, any like punk rock i used to be a dj on the radio when I was the first college that I went to. And I actually, I purposely, so when I was making this uh, piece um, inspired by, I actually purposely was listening to a lot of Parliament Funkadelic because, you know, I was thinking about Afrofuturism. But for a lot of my other work, um, I try actually not to listen to music. The reason why is because I used to do it so much. I didn't want it to be like a catalyst for me to make music. I just wanted to be able to enjoy the music and I didn't want to have to rely on music for my inspiration because I believe other things should inspire you besides music, right? You know, you walk outside, you know, you look at trees, you think about nature, you think about laughter, which I guess is sort of like music. Right. Um, you so, in, a, in a sense, you are the music and you're expressing that in your work, like it shows with your line work. And I think it's interpreted in different ways with different artists, but we all have a sort of artists all have a musical quality to, to them. So mm -hmm. with my own work, I express it in patterns and sort of Islamic sort of motifs. You, you, send, you tend to express it in your line work in very sort of symmetrical ways. So there is that sort of underlying similarities that play with mm -hmm. us all as artists, no? Yeah. And you know, the thing is too, I, uh, I read a lot. So a lot of my ideas do come from like books, right? So um, I'm a really big fan, like I said, of Afrofuturism and uh, Octavia Butler, but also like uh, James Baldwin and uh, Toni Morrison. And I always have this thing about, you know, women in art, women in literature, because, you know, there needs to, I feel like, as people who are striving to be in balance, people of the middle path, you know, sometimes I feel like it's always kind of heavier on the male side, right? Rather than um, on the female side, right? Because if, uh, if your spouse is supposed to be 50% of your dean, then you know, that's, you know, that's evenness. And I feel like 
you know, to be like people, when you say God, Allah, Allah is not a man or a woman. And I think people kind of forget that. So we, I, that's why a lot of my work kind of focuses on like, you know, this is a woman with a baby. This is a woman going to the market because, you know, I think those energies are sort of out of balance sometimes. And even for our own selves and in our daily life, you know, we see a lot of that imbalance. So I like to try to put a lot about that balance back into my work. Um, and then I do that by, you know, reading a lot. So, um, and I think those authors that I mentioned, they actually have, you know, a lot of strong, I, well, I don't like that, I don't like that word, strong, strong, I would say positive female characters who are, you know, somewhat broken, but they manage to still give love and receive love, right? So I try to think about that when I'm doing my work sometimes. So that's the influence like literature has. So I try to get influences from all things that I really enjoy. You know, even if it's just taking a walk with the fam. <laughs> <laughs> I like the movements of your pieces too. All of your works have a lot of movement in them. How do you know when you're finished? <laughs> You know, I was thinking about that because I was, when I was looking at that inspired by, you know, one of the biggest things for me was like a figure. So, you know, when, when the thing that always kind of bothered me was like not being formally trained and then you get formally trained and then you learn all these, these techniques and these words. Right. So one of them, um, my, one of my art teachers was like, oh, your stuff is always floating. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, like the figure ground planes, right? So I just like took that all out of my life, like no more floating anything. So once I put these on the page, on the paper, and I was like, you know, these things are, these, these two are going to be floating because in their universe, they're everywhere. So, you know, you kind of have to let some of that, when is it finished? kind of let it go, let your ego go a little bit, like, you know, like, okay, <laughs> this is, this is done, this is done, and, you know, be okay with it if it doesn't look done, right, because my, my, the backgrounds for me, you know, they're always really bare, you know, I don't really put a lot of stuff in the background, it's like everything that's there is supposed to be there, and that's it, but then formally, you're not supposed to do that, you're not, you're always supposed to, like, color the back and then draw on top of that right yeah. but i'm like okay i'm not doing that because i don't want to do that and that's the only reason why so according to me based on what i feel this is done <laughs> so that's what i'm I, it, it is it's a struggle don't don't get me wrong it's a struggle <laughs> so I, I work on it you know it's just like something that i struggle with but i don't mind the conflict and i don't mind the struggle because you know that's really, you know, what it's about also, right? Right. It's what your work says to you and what you want your work to say to others, you know? Right. Exactly. So exactly. On that balance, I mean, and your lines are sharp, girl. Your lines are sharp. Your work, you can see the thought process and, and, and the intent, but also the movement and the freedom of it at the same time. I love it. I love it so much. Thank and you, thank you. Know, you. Like seeing you as a person, this speaks to who you are directly. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I appreciate freedom, but you know, freedom's not free. So you know, and then real and real freedom is going back to your Lord. Like, you know, your soul always wants to go to the one who blew it into your body, right? Honestly. So that's we're struggling to like, yes, <laughs> you know, that's that's the real freedom. So I know like any concept of freedom that I have here, you know, yeah, it feels great and all that kind of stuff, but the real freedom, you know, that's, I think that's why some of the stuff is always like floating. You know, I think about like the lines, especially like the lines, like they're all never, never really tethered. You know, right. there's all something going somewhere. Yeah, it's, that's what I mean with the movement. Like it's always like almost off or is it like coming at you? Is it, going away from you? Is it, is it leading somewhere? Like, I like that. It's intriguing. It's right. Like, it's just that back and forth, you know, it's just like yeah. that, you know, push and pull that like in the back, in the front, you know, and I wanted to have a, a sense of depth, you know, um, 
it's kind of hard because then you're looking at it from different angles and you're like, oh, but then you get to that point where you're like, okay, I'm going to stay with it. And you just stay with it and trust the process and just keep, you know, going forward yes. with that same idea of freedom, with that same idea, excuse me, of um, that same idea of freedom and what those ideas that you came into the piece with, you know, sometimes they evolve, sometimes they say the same. You know, sometimes you're kind of disappointed. You're like, ah, but then sometimes you're pleasantly surprised. Very much so. How do you choose the sizes that you're going to work on? Really? I mean, I'm, I'm attracted to materials. I just like paper. I like pens. I mean, I, I like the stuff. Well, we go into the store and we're like, we're in the art candy store. <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> Like I'll pick, I'll just like pick up a pen, but you know, sometimes I intentionally look for like, you know, things that I feel I can be precise with. Mm -hmm. I think more, I would like to challenge myself to pick up things that I would maybe not be so sure with using them, but you know, use them anyway, just to kind of challenge myself and kind of push myself, you know, out of my comfort zone. Right. That's a good point. That's a good point. So I know that you touched on this a little bit, but where are, where do you see yourself going with your art practice now in terms of even if you get your own space and you're going to be, you want, you are an artist, but that is your only profession at this point, like what direction would that be? What would that look like for you? Well, you know, I would like to get my PhD and uh, I would like to teach and lecture. Um, because I think it's kind of important. Um, I actually went to SUNY Purchase and one of the big issues that I had with SUNY Purchase is I had not one instructor of color, like not one. And every single year at the end of the semester, we had to, you know, write a review and I would, so they would give us a, you know, a page and it would have everything that you could check, check this box if you like this. So I would never check the boxes, but on the back, I would write this really scathing <laughs> in-depth letter to the, uh, to the, uh, the head of the art and, de art and design uh, program. And I was like, you know, how dare you accept uh, students of color and you don't have any teachers of color and how are you educating artists of color? Like, you know, what are we supposed to be doing? So it's like, this is a state school. You're getting state money, you know, get some, get some, get some um, professors of color. So my last year, they got a photography adjunct teacher who was there two days a week. And, you know, I'm not a photography major, but I took photography for, for two, for a semester. So photography one and two, but I'm just like, really, for real? And it was really interesting. The other day I was out for a walk with my husband and I saw this girl, she had a purchase t-shirt and I'm like, hey, go purchase. And she was like, oh, you went to purchase? I'm like, yeah. I said, did you go to purchase? She's like, yeah. I was like, yeah, I was in the A&D program. And she's just like, oh my God. She's like, you know, I said, do they have any? She's like, she's like, the, the, the program sucks now. It's terrible, blah, 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 blah. And I was just like, wow. You know, and that's, so one of the things, and I, I think that kind of really um, went a long way. I had to really develop some really tough skin because I would hear these professors say some crazy stuff. I mean, this one um, professor was like, oh, you should get still wool because it's more like your hair to represent you. And I was just like, do you know uh, Right, okay. exactly. I was just like, I just looked at her like, what's so comfortable saying it? And you're just like, did that? Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I really would love to, you know, especially like teach like the core subjects, like, you know, drawing, design, painting, to freshmen and you know really just um helping them kind of get through that initial process because if you can get through that that core work then definitely you know you you, you know you develop you you develop more and you feel less insecure yeah it's a confidence thing even oh yeah 100 percent. yeah because you know some some people they were the superstar in their school and then they come to college and people are like um what are you doing like you're just drawing pretty stuff. I'm not gonna okay. see that. <laughs> I'm drawing pretty stuff. Yeah, that's is that, but is that art? You know, and then when you ask them that question, they're like, well, they just kind of look at you like a deer in the headlights. Like, you know, you don't you always wanna give the student confidence to move forward with whatever answer that they have. You know, they can ask, they can answer that question however they want. They just need to be able to back it up. Right. So, you know, I think I would love to you know, lecture, I would like to, you know, 
um, like I said, get my PhD and, you know, write books, curate shows, be in shows, travel, you know, all the superstar art stuff. <laughs> but of course, you know, I have kids, so. Well, that's, that's not a reason, and you know. <laughs> it's not, are you sure? <laughs> I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure. They want to make a reason. question. Yes. I just have a comment. You know, you were talking, I'm going to just dial it back to what you're saying about your image is floating. You know, I was just thinking about, you know, Toni Morrison, she talks about art in America and how classic American art, especially literature, is always informed by racism. And she talks about how, you know, literary and the imagination, they fill spaces in the background with this kind of uh, darkness, this kind of um, ethereal darkness that represents this invisible entity, this invisible slave, this invisible black person. And it's interesting that your background, you know, you talk about Toni Morrison kind of informing your work, that your background is kind of free of all of that. Mm. That's, you know, reflecting wow. it back to the idea that she has about American literature specifically, and, you know, how the imagination can be cluttered with these um, images that represent things that you don't want to see or touch specifically for African-Americans, you know, that you don't have kind of those things, you know, it's kind of more direct and it's there and there's no, there's nothing hiding. Yeah, that's, wow, that's a beautiful analogy. Thank you so much. And you know, that is, you know, that could be part and parcel to it because I want you to see like, you know, I'm here, right? This is here. Like this woman is here. Like, even though she's, she's a abstract, representation of a woman and a child or abstract representation of a woman going to the market but that's exactly who it is and she's there and I want you to see that woman and I guess in, in a sense I want you to see me as an artist as a person who uh, dug deep and came up with this and felt it was important to put it out there you know when you look at even if you look at things like say Woody Allen movies right notorious for not having not one black face. And you know, he films in New York. I'm like, how do you, how does that happen? Like it's Even by accident on the show. It's not a, it's, it can't, it's not an accident. Woody Allen is very into jazz. <laughs> and you know, we know where jazz came from. So Woody Allen knows that black people exist. So, <laughs> I mean, my thing is, is like, look, when we think about like contemporary issues and contemporary times, right? We, you know, I try, I, I mean, by happenstance, I come from the other, right? But I necessarily don't feel like the other. Like, so I'm not coming, I'm not coming from that point where I'm painting or drawing or presenting art as the other. I'm, I am presenting and painting art as a primary, right? And not as the minority. I am presenting, doing art as the majority because I don't feel like the minority, right? unless you make me feel like the minority and I try to fight that all the time, right? Whether it's in art, whether it's like walking down the street, getting on a bus, getting not followed around the soup, the supermarket. So when I, I guess, was a, so when I'm doing my artwork, yeah, that's it. That's, this is what it is. This is this lady and she's going to the market and you know, she's always the hero. That's always first. Like, every scenario they're always the hero right and they're always on a mission of something positive and something great is going to happen like my intention is never like oh she's you know going to blow up the market or stab up people no my intention is always to present something in a great beautiful light that is related to black people black history and black culture and my own personal family and my own personal culture which i am extremely proud of and never ashamed of and honestly i'm gonna say this and you know forgive me and i don't like to qualify things because i feel like we're all grown but i will do it you know muslims sometimes make black folks of american descent feel like culturally they're inept they're irrelevant they have nothing to contribute to the muslim world and or in, in, in essence, if you consider yourself a Muslim first, then you're saying, well, are you saying that I have nothing to contribute to the world? That's kind of what it sounds like. So when I'm doing my work, it's always 
someone's going out doing something beautiful and positive because that's how I was brought up and how I was raised. And it's like, you go out and you do something positive. You go out and be the best Muslim that you can be. Black Muslim at that. No, exactly what you mean. Because it was like, I didn't realize that I was irrelevant until I left my house. You know, I was like, oh. Exactly. Not- exactly. Because we grew up in the, in the kind of community that let us know that, you know, being African-American and being Muslim are synonymous with being amazing and, and culturally, right. we had our own our own steps into it. But I cannot, in all honesty, be upset with other cultures that are that are telling me about mine because I need to be proud of who I am anyway. And right, exactly. To allow someone to tell us and then believe them, that's our issue. Right, Uh-oh. exactly. But you know, as a as a person who possesses emotion, sometimes it does make me feel like a little oh. of times you step back. Oh. I'm yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because uh, it's, it's the litmus, right? Yes. May I may I say something? Please. Yes, you may. Okay. Uh, this my name is Zaid B. Islam. Um uh I have three wonderful daughters. Uh, each of them are different and they're all talented in their own ways. Uh, I think one of the things their mother and I stressed on them growing up was even if we disagree, as your parents was a good idea that you have, pursue it anyway until you find out it's not a good idea or it's a good idea. I did not raise them to be uh, bootlickers or anything of that nature. I raised them to be leaders and thinkers for themselves, uh, regardless of who might come into your life. And I really Love them all. I got to say all three of them, because all three of them is here. I say something about one, not the other ones going to be upset. But I, this creativity side that uh, Maya is displaying, uh, I would say comes from her grandmother on my side <laughs> of the family, because that's how my mother was creative. And everything that's creative uh, about me uh, comes from my mother. And I also had a wonderful father. And that's it. But this is uh, great. Okay, girl, I'm proud of you. <laughs> oh, thanks, Dad. Alhamdulillah. We can end on that, Maya. We, there's nothing else to say. Oh, I'm, and I, I'm blessed to know such amazing artists. And like I said, you know, you're my technical person. And I appreciate this talk with you. I appreciate you doing this with us. And, and your art, as always, is amazing. Oh, it so is. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity and thank you for your support forever. You know, uh, what could I, what would I do without you? I don't even know. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> well, um, everybody. This brings- Shukran, everyone for showing up and supporting. I really appreciate it. And please come to the other artist talks. They're awesome. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.